Okay, that work all is up, up, is up including me. <laughs> all right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's a wonderful sunny day. I can't believe we have spring in Feb, right? Yeah, very confused. It's the 25th of uh, February. We are at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Maple. And a very, very good morning to you. A warm welcome to our Reverend Shepherd and his wife. And a very warm welcome to Gina, our pianist, organist, and uh, music director. So welcome. Good morning, Gina. And thank you for all of you being here. And uh, if you have any things to update for your contact details, the little cards on the pews here. And as usual, we have fellowship after the services. So without further ado, we'll kick off our service with the call to worship. Thank you. Let us begin with our call to worship. Thus says the high and holy one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I will dwell in the high and holy place and also with those of contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let us stand to sing our opening hymn this morning, 291, Thou Whose Almighty Word. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, over 2,500 years ago, an unnamed prophet cried, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And then over 2,000 years ago, the Lord, whose glory is a light, appeared in our midst. 
And so we come to you, our great God and Savior, for you have told us that you turn away no one. You forsake no one. You abandon no one. But all who look to you in faith will be saved. And accept the worship we bring this morning, for we want to renew our commitment to you. We want to reaffirm our confidence in you. And we want to know afresh that you have drawn us into your own life and love and this forever. Even as we do know, O oh God, that you do draw us into your own life and love. We are aware that the light that you are highlights the shadow areas of our lives. As your spirit settles upon us and searches us, we come to know ourselves as sinners who grieve you who yet love us and long for us. In our period of confession today, hear us as we lay before you the sin we are ashamed to admit, the sin to which we have blinded ourselves, and the sin whose seriousness we have trivialized. And then by your spirit, speak to us the word of pardon, for we long to be forgiven. By your spirit, inflame our hearts once again, for we long to be zealous in the cause of the gospel. By your spirit, grant us wisdom and our witness, for we want to magnify the good news which has restored us and can restore anyone who looks to you. Grant unto us now assurance that we are your children, that you cherish us as no one else does, and that we are destined to be drawn into your glory eternally. Amen. 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 Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you, says the Lord. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also and with you. And also peace with you. Everyone. Children, do we have any children to come forward this morning? We do, we do. And after this, children are invited to the back, if they like, with the permission of the parents, with some Bible story reading and some related artwork, all right? Uh, with Debbie and uh, Sawyer and any other volunteer. Thank you. I like to drink tea, lots of tea. And I like to drink tea out of a big mug, a nice clean mug like this. I have several like this. It holds 16 and a half fluid ounces. And I drink about six of these a day. Now, how much tea is that? I was told there'd be no math. <laughs> it's a lot of tea, yes. That's a like, gosh, I like this cup. Isn't it a nice white clean cup? No. no, it's not. It's filthy inside. It is filthy. You wouldn't drink tea out of this cup. You wouldn't drink anything out of this cup. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ once said that there are people like us who are like clean cups on the outside, but inside not so clean. And our Lord home? Jesus Christ says that we have to have a clean heart, a clean mind, clean lips, and clean hands. A clean heart is means that everything about us has be, to be renewed and cleansed by him, our blessed Lord. A clean mind means that we are to think in conformity with his truth and wisdom in the gospel. Clean lips means that we are to speak in such a way as to honor him and not defame or despise other people. And clean hands means that we are supposed to do only what is right. Now, the psalmist says, renew, give me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Can you repeat that after me? Give me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, 10. Good. Now, I'm going to go home and I'm going to drink tea out of this cup. <laughs> but only, only after it has been made clean as surely as I want my heart ever to be made clean by our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ puts his finger on what is out of order in our lives. And we know that just as surely he promises to put it into order. Then as we come to church and Sunday school week by week, grant that we might ever hear his truth, welcome him into the hearts that he has made new and uphold his truth near and far. Amen. Can you go out to Sunday school now? Yes, of course. Let's pray. Loving God, attend to us as we open your word. May our hearts and spirits listen for your will for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is taken from Genesis 17, 1 to 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you. And your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Our epistle lesson this morning is found in Paul's letter to the church in the city of Colossae, and we shall begin reading at verse 1, for chapter 1, verse 15. He, that is Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. 
For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And our gospel lesson this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 9. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Thank you. The title of this morning's sermon is, What is Faith? Listen to the testimony of four witnesses. It happened at the corner of Major Mackenzie Drive and Keel Street. It was a collision. A crowd gathered quickly as crowds always do, but the crowd was no help once police officers and insurance adjusters and lawyers wanted to know what had happened. These people weren't interested in hearing from the crowd. These people wanted to hear from witnesses. When the handful of witnesses, witnesses are always fewer than crowds, when the handful of witnesses began to testify, their testimony had much in common. It overlapped hugely. It couldn't be doubted that all the witnesses were speaking of the same collision. At the same time, no two witnesses said exactly the same thing. Each testimony differed slightly according to the witness's angle of vision on the event. No one thought for a minute of saying that only one witness could be right and therefore all others had to be wrong. In fact, just because different witnesses bring forward slightly differing testimonies, we know that the story is authentic. We know that the witnesses haven't conspired secretly under the table to work up something or fabricate something artificial. In the days of his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ collided. <laughs> Every day, with many persons and many institutions, the collision that our Lord was inevitably drew a crowd. But the crowd he drew can't help us to understand what happened when our Lord acted then and what continues to happen when he acts among us now. For this, we need the testimony of witnesses. Their testimony is indispensable in our coming to grasp who Jesus Christ is and what faith in him entails. As we receive their testimony, we shall find that these witnesses agree in essence concerning Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, we shall find too that different witnesses highlight different insights. This fact only assures us that their testimony is authentic and therefore can be trusted. Now, in the course of the many collisions he occasioned, Jesus summoned men and women to join him. He summoned them to faith in him. He promised to sustain and strengthen their faith. He summons, sustains, and strengthens today as well. Then there's only one crucial issue for us to sort out. What does faith in Jesus Christ mean? And what does faith in Jesus Christ entail? Now, in order to answer this question, we're going to receive the testimony of four witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Today, however, we're going to hear these men in reverse order, John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. First, John. Faith, says the apostle John, is the conviction that Jesus Christ is the mirror image of God the Father. It's the conviction that Jesus Christ is the living presence of God embodied in our flesh and blood. Faith, says John, is also confidence in the mission and message of this Emmanuel, God with us. And faith is also confession of loyalty to him. According to John, faith always entails conviction, confidence, confession. Philip is a disciple, a follower, who happens to be tossed around by the turbulence that always surrounds Jesus. After months of being jostled and jarred, months of being thrown off balance, just when he thought he was beginning to get things sorted out, Philip hungers for one conclusive disclosure of God. Just show us the Father and that will be enough for us, he says to Jesus. Philip replies, the master, to see me is to see the Father. To see me is the one you want. I am the disclosure you crave. It's odd, isn't it, that the answer that satisfied Philip irks people today. To see me is to see the Father, says Jesus, and this irks people today. How narrow they complain, how insufferably narrow. Well, let's be honest, it is narrow. If, Jesus, if John had said that the living word, capital W, if John had said that the living word of God, God's self-utterance and self-giving, if John had said that this word became words, human speech, speeches even, nobody would object. But John never says that the word became words, speeches, chatter. John insists that the word has become flesh, one man, one man only. From Nazareth, at that, a one-horse town. Nazareth was to Jerusalem, in terms of sophistication and glamour, what Podunksville is to Paris. What's more, flesh for John refers not merely to human existence. Flesh means also human existence under the conditions of sin. Then is John telling us that the word became flesh? that God has identified himself conclusively with a hayseed from Nazareth, who in turn has self-identified with sinners? Yes, John is saying exactly this. God is to be found definitively in a one-horse town, in the person of an ordinary Jew, who is numbered among the transgressors, and therefore who is publicly disgraced. In this one man, God has drawn so very near to us that he couldn't draw nearer. Now, if you are irked by the supposed narrowness of John's conviction and conviction, and you are starting to fidget, please take heart and please know what is not said. It is not said that God has neglected or forsaken people who are not Christians. Nevertheless, it is in Jesus Christ that we learn that God neither neglects nor forsakes anyone. It is not said that God isn't free to disclose himself anywhere he wishes. Nevertheless, the witnesses we are hearing and heeding today were convinced that in Jesus Christ, God can always be found for sure. It is not said that while God may be present with all peoples, God is active only in the history of Israel, the one people that gave us Jesus. As a matter of fact, Amos, the prophet Amos, tells us that just as God was active in Israel's history, bringing the Israelites up out of Egypt, so God has been active, no less active, says Amos, in the history of the Philistines and the history of the Syrians. Nevertheless, in Jesus Christ, we can identify what God is doing in human history among diverse peoples. It is not said that God has been sensed only in Jesus of Nazareth. Nevertheless, 
in the man from Nazareth, God has seized us with a clarity and a cogency that constrains us to speak of him and forbids us to remain silent. Faith, says the Apostle John, is the conviction that Jesus Christ is the living address of the God who has come among us in our own humanness and identified himself with us in our sinfulness. Faith, says John, is also confidence in this man's mission and message. And not least, faith is public confession of our loyalty to him. Luke. For Luke, Jesus is everything that Jesus is for John, together with Luke's particular angle of vision. Namely, for Luke, Jesus is especially the friend of those whom the world laughs at or laughs off or overlooks or conveniently prefers to forget. For Jesus, for Luke, Jesus is the friend of the least, the lonely, the last, and the lost. As a witness, Luke has noticed that Jesus consistently stands up for and stands with anyone who is trampled or rejected or simply defenseless. Women. Women, for instance. In Luke's day, women were regarded as little more than an item in their husband's property. A divorcee or a widow was extraordinarily vulnerable. Not only was the woman brushed aside as a no account, she was often financially strapped as well. In his testimony to Jesus, Luke mentions 13 women. Count them. 13 women who are not mentioned in any other written gospel. Perceptively, Luke noticed that Jesus honored women especially and elevated them. Luke's heart is as big as a house when he thinks of those whom life is ground down or when he thinks of the struggle, relentless struggle that renders life ceaselessly difficult for some people. Yet Luke's heart is as big as a house only because he has first found his Lord's heart even bigger. He has witnessed Christ's concern for the social outcast, such as the swindler who fleeces people and turns the entire community against himself. That's Zacchaeus. Or the dying terrorist, like that fellow in London, Ontario, concerning whom people mutter good riddance or the hooker from the red light district, not to mention the poor. Luke testifies most movingly of Christ's care for the poor and his esteem for those people. There's something else. More than any other witness, Luke speaks of joy, rejoicing, laughter, merriment, partying. He knows that Christ's concern for the overwhelmed and underfed the loser and the outcast, the defenseless and the diseased. He loathes that our Lord's championing of these people is never shrill. It's never grim. There's neither the grimness of the steely do-gooder nor the nastiness of those who want to bring down their privileged. There's only irrepressible joy that these people, the marginalized, have a place in God's kingdom. Jesus laughs and jokes and parties with them all. If you read the Gospel of Luke with even one eye open, you can't help noticing that there is a depiction of a party on every other page. Everything our Lord does for those sunk in misery, he does so very cheerfully as to render those people cheerful ever, ever after. When Maureen and I first visited the Iona community in the Church of Scotland, located in the Hebridean Islands, we met several people who go there for much needed restoration just because their work unfolds every day among the seemingly hopeless, the impoverished of Britain's slums. Now, I'm not denying for a minute that we have underprivileged areas in Canadian cities. I'm not denying that. At the same time, what we have in Canada doesn't hold a candle to the slums in the UK. One woman we met works among the squatters, as they are called in the shabbiest parts of London. As residents move out of subsidized housing for any reason at all, 
workmen are hired to refurbish the newly vacated apartment. Before the workmen can follow on the heels of the outgoing residents, however, other people move in as squatters. They move in and they take over. Now, any attempt at ousting these people spells trouble. Big, ugly confrontations, dangerous confrontations with housing authorities, police officers, and anybody else. The woman we met works among these squatters whose building is now called the Squats. And she works on behalf of London's housing authority. She often finds herself in fearsome situations. Now we mustn't paint the picture any less bleak than it is. The squatters material future is dismal beyond telling. They have nothing to lose. And because they have nothing to lose, they are frequently violent. It takes no little courage to work among them, but it takes more than courage. It takes a special sort of huge hearted humanness that silently gains the trust of desperate people. Now this particular woman says that she loves her work. <laughs> She senses in it the surge of God's kingdom. And as she spoke about her work to Maureen and me, she glowed. And she does it all with a radiance that her people see in few others. Her joy in the midst of them is a manifestation of that kingdom which knows no misery. Faith, according to the Apostle Luke, entails living in the company of Jesus Christ as he moves among the loneliest and the least, and the last. Mark's angle of vision is slightly different again. There in acquainting us with his particular insight and emphasis. <clears throat> Mark testifies that faith means holding up Christ's victory anywhere there seems to be human defeat. Mark has observed that Jesus Christ is the conquering one, Mark sees Jesus taking on hostile power after hostile power, sin, sickness, sorrow, suffering, the demonic. These hostile powers are really errand boys. They are goers, flunkies. They are errand boys and gophers who do the bidding of Mr. Big, the comprehensive hostile power, death. Now, Mr. Big, death has many airmen boys or flunkies these lesser powers afflict you and me and others and not content with afflicting us they torment us sin torments all of us sickness torments and teases the ill sorrow continues to torment the bereaved long after they thought sorrow would have left them alone death's errin boys wear us down they crumble our resistance to Mr. Big, who gets every one of us at the last. However, Mark announces, Jesus Christ is conqueror. Death overtook him, only to find him overtaking it. Death frustrated him, only to be frustrated itself as he was raised from the dead and publicized <clears throat> his victory. Faith in Jesus Christ, Mark testifies, is a matter of holding up Christ's victory wherever anyone is afflicted and tormented by Mr. Big's flunkies who soften us up for Mr. Big himself. As you and I are possessed of faith, we soak ourselves in Christ's victory. We are steeped in such assurance of his triumph that our assurance fortifies the assurance of those who are harassed at this moment. A pastor, everybody knows, is expected to attend the dying. A week or two ago, I mentioned from the pulpit here that I have conducted funerals for 550 people. There's a brand new hospice in Vaughan at Islington and Rutherford. And a week or two, I was invited to, I was asked to go and visit a man there who's carcinoma had gone into his brain and I did so. I shall bury him Saturday afternoon. 
coming. Why am I there? Why was I there? Because I have a pre-recorded bedside message I can just flip on? That's an affront to everybody. A pastor attends the dying for one reason. He has Christ's victory so deep in his bloodstream that he radiates it. It oozes out of him, even if he is in a situation so terrible that nothing can be said. And if nothing be said, we're better off not to say it. It's the same with all Christ's people. We sit with our friend who is ill. We sit with our friend whose husband, aged 47, has just been carried off with a heart attack. We visit someone whose elderly parent has deteriorated mentally and is all but unrecognizable, yet manages to arouse sadness and shame and anger and guilt in his family all at once. We sit and we say little, I trust. We are possessed of such assurance of our Lord's victory that our assurance, as deep as our DNA, spills over onto our friend and finds its way past her tears. Faith, says the Apostle Mark. Faith, says Mark, is being drawn into Christ's triumph. Faith is being forever altered by Christ's triumph. Faith, says Mark, is thereafter flaunting Christ's triumph in the face of anything and anyone who wants to deny it. Well, that brings us to Matthew. For Matthew, faith is everything that it is for all the witnesses alike. Public acknowledgement that Jesus is the Son of God incarnate, the Word become flesh, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world, and the Lord of the universe. Everybody agrees with that. All witnesses agree in this matter. Yet Matthew too has his particular angle of vision, namely, faith is hearing and heeding and obeying the chief rabbi. When Matthew's gospel was written in the first century, there were no chapters and verse distinctions. We added those in the 16th century in the Renaissance. There were no chapter and verse dis distinctions then. There was just one continuous document. However, Matthew's gospel is clearly divided into five distinct blocks of teaching. And the five blocks of teaching in Matthew's gospel correspond to the five books of Moses. Jesus is clearly Moses enlarged. When Jesus began, begins teaching the Sermon on the Mount, you must have noticed when you read the Sermon on the Mount, he sits to teach. Notice that? Jesus sits to teach. Now, Presbyterian ministers stand to preach. Never mind, never mind. Rabbis always sat to teach. Now, to be sure, Jesus is more than a rabbi. Matthew would insist, but he's a rabbi at least, greater than authority than Moses. And Jesus is the rabbi above all other rabbis. Therefore, we must hear him and heed him and obey him. Now, I admit it's relatively easy to support with Mark our suffering brothers and sisters as we surround them with our assurance of Christ's victory. In fact, if we do this, we feel good about it. And I admit it's easy to agree with Luke that Jesus cherished the poor and the maimed and the trampled, and therefore we should support them too. And it's easy to assent with John to the truth that Jesus is the word made flesh. Yet it's always possible to do all of this while remaining indifferent to our own concrete, specific obedience. Matthew insists that to have faith in Jesus Christ means we're going to obey him. We're going to do it. Jesus tells us, for instance, that if we write off another human being, if we merely speak contemptuously of her, we are in danger of ultimate loss ourselves. If we act compassionately only toward those whom we deem to deserve our compassion, then we haven't a clue as to the nature of God. 
If we think God is going to forgive us at the same time as we harden our heart against those who have wounded us, then we are pathetically mistaken. We mustn't evade the road we've been appointed to walk, even if the road is narrow and the way hard, and those who persist in it are few. Of course, the road we've been appointed to walk is challenging at all times and occasionally even difficult. Were it anything else, we wouldn't be walking, we'd be meandering or sashaying, or shuffling, or even merely strolling. Matthew says that the Christian life isn't a stroll. It's a resolute walking of that way, which Jesus says identifies us as his people since he walks the same road with us. Now, this road ever remains the road we must walk if we are going to remain in the company of Jesus. For he is the companion of those who walk this road and he pledges himself nowhere else. I began today by reminding us that our Lord collided with all sorts of individuals and institutions in the days of his earthly ministry. The collision that he was always attracted crowds as collisions always do. Crowds, however, are merely onlookers. Witnesses, on the other hand, are part of the event. The witnesses we call apostles testify to Jesus Christ, even as each one testifies to our Lord from his own perspective, his own angle of vision. The testimony of John. Faith in Jesus is the conviction that he is Emmanuel, God with us. It's the confidence in his mission and message and the confession of truth concerning him. John's testimony is bedrock. It's foundational for the other three. On top of this, Luke testifies that Jesus is the friend of the lowly and the despised. Mark, that Jesus is the conqueror of everything that threatens to separate us from God, death preeminently. Matthew, that Jesus is the chief rabbi whom we haven't truly heard unless we have also aspired to obey. Is your faith strong? Is mine? Jesus doesn't think so. Jesus tells us that even the person of the strongest faith apparently is weak in faith. For this reason, our Lord insists, you and I are to pray every day for increased faith strengthened faith, then may you and I ever be found crying to God, increase our faith, knowing that he wants this for you and me even more than we want it for ourselves. I think we should sing hymn number 671, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and raise. I Jesus and I pray. 
seated. The offering, please. And donations can be made to our partnership with Canda Helps to go to www.candahelps.org slash en slash dn slash 56495. Or donations can be mailed or delivered to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, 9860 Keel Street, Bonn, Ontario, L6A, 3Y4. We are interested in having your donations to St. Andrew's taken from your account on a monthly basis. Send an email to St. Andrew's Pres Maple at belnet.ca and we'll send you out the information for pre authorized remittance. Now, friends, let us stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Here, O Lord, is the labor of our hands. Here is the love of our hearts. Accept us and use us with these, our gifts we ask. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for your kind offerings, announcements as usual. Uh, we have communion next Sunday, so everybody's welcome. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Reverend, for the lovely sermon. And thank you to Gina, who is uh, going to be with us two Sundays a month initially, as she's a uh, busy music director of her music school in uh, Rutherford Road, Vaughan. And um, it's called Mosaic, right? Yes. Yeah, Mosaic School of Music. All right, we have a session meeting tomorrow night, so um, at 7 o'clock here, 7.30. Excuse me, is there a session meeting for? Not tomorrow, next oh, week. No, no, next week. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a week from a week from yep. tomorrow. Oh, don't Dementia. scare me because I I have a teaching appointment in Victoria, BC tomorrow night. Okay. You're not bearing anyone tomorrow. That's good. You scared me. <laughs> February um, is a short month, but not that short. <laughs> I'm leaping forward. Pun intended. Mm. <laughs> yes, fourth of March. Sorry, guys. Um yeah, and our annual gel meeting. I've got this one right now, 10th of March, okay? I'd love all of you to attend. And yes, committee members, have all your reports ready, please, and send to Alan by end of the month. 
Sunday school, as usual, with the teachers, Fabrizio and Ashley, um, once a month on March 17th, with Daria and Debbie on March 10th, and other days with Debbie and a volunteer doing um, Bible, uh, Bible stories and artwork. Earth Hour, uh, 23rd March, uh, that's Saturday, and that's at night. Uh, it's at the City Hall, so we need volunteers for that too. And it's actually quite enjoyable. Lots of booths and vendors uh, for you to kind of browse through and see environmental friendly um, items. And yes, we will be singing on stage. So we need voices for that evening. It's just for like eight minutes or so, okay? Uh, food bank as usual, perishable, non-perishable foods and um, volunteer op opportunities. Uh, our sheets are up on the bulletin board at the back. And thank you, Naomi. Lovely bulletin as always. Um, art and craft today Debbie will be demonstrating how you transfer uh, pictures like this on napkins or other pictures how do you transfer that on glass it's quite interesting so uh, do visit the art and craft table and um, the children can also do cards and bookmarks I think that's it for now and I will hand it over to Alan for the mission moment right All right All right, today's uh, mission moment. We really appreciate the program as we are in dire need to keep the education going for our kids, shared a grateful parent. For Afghan children who sought refuge in Pakistan, education is often out of reach because they are not nationals. PWS and D, that's Presbyterian World Service and Development, supports the Digital Learning Center in Peshawar, which provides out of school children and adults with basic digital literacy classes high school courses and tutoring sessions that aim to help a total of 520 students. Students and their family members are benefiting from the Darakti Dinesh Library, which provides free and open educational resources on such topics as math, language, business, and the sciences. Students access classes both in English and Dari Farsi, equipping them with essential skills and providing hope for those who have lost so much broadening their opportunities for the future. I know those young people, perhaps like Nevea, who's here uh, helping me with uh, AB, might not like school as much, but you know, there's lots of kids around the world who don't get to enjoy uh, school and be able to learn. So friends, uh, just remember that when you're making your donations to St. Andrews, consider that there are those uh, extra boxes on those envelopes, or if you're doing the online, that there are those pull-down menus for to direct gifts to specific purposes. And all the funds that we receive for those purposes go to those purposes. I want to thank you all for all the generous donations that you send to, to us here at St. Andrews so that we can continue our ministries. And now let me pass it back to Reverend Victor. Let us pray. Eternal God, it is with thanksgiving that we turn to you in this season of Lent. For your gift of Christ crucified and raised is nothing less than a self-given. Given once we know, but also given again and again, as surely as our need of you endures. Eternal God, it is with joy that we turn to you at this time. For in Jesus Christ, you have lifted us up and will hold us up as surely and as constantly as your grip on us will ever remain stronger than our grip on you. Eternal God, it is with peace that we meditate upon you at this time. For in Jesus Christ, you have bridged the abyss between us and you. In him, you will ever stand by us, stand up for us, remain with us, and speak to us as surely as, and as constantly as we are foolish or fearful or confused. Eternal God, it is with renewed dedication that we worship you today. For we have seen once again that our greatest need you have met in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our deepest longing you have satisfied. Our greatest joy you have not withheld from us. And our most human hunger you have fed. Then direct us anew to our blessed Lord, that our eagerness for him might match his passion for us. We conclude our prayers in the name he taught us as we say together, our, our Father, Father, 
who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our concluding hymn this morning is 368, Let Christian Faith and Hope Dispel. Please stand if you are able. 368. Let Christian faith and hope dispel the fears of guilt and woe. The Lord Almighty is our friend and who can prove a hope. The Savior died but rose again. Jesus Christ, you did come. In his abiding presence, go now in peace. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with you always. And on behalf of the session here at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, I want to thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, uh, Victor, for leading us in that wonderful service. Thank you to Gina behind my shoulder here uh, for playing on the piano. Thanks to Novea here helping me on the AV. And, uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Jackie for doing the announcements and being welcoming older. And to and Joyce for reading the, the Bible and singing so beautifully. You have to join me up here. Come I on. think that's true. So if you Come didn't on, hear Joyce. that, that was Joyce. Uh, you could have heard her voice. Come I'm not sure we'll if you get to hear it on the on the side but here friends for those who are staying please remember to join us in the fellowship hall for a uh, time of fellowship and for those who are leaving us may you now go in peace
Thank you all and have a blessed week. See you at the poetry hall.